All right, welcome to Speak For Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That is Marcellus Wiley, that dude. All right, coming up, we'll tell you Big Ben is the Steelers' biggest problem right now. And if football has gotten too soft. Aw. <laughs> well, we start today with the Whitlocks. What you got today, big dog? Oh, man, I got Earl Thomas. I got a message for Earl Thomas. Message? And all the other current and former players who can't contain their seething animosity toward the NFL. Stop the foolishness. Quit acting like NFL owners raided medical schools, law schools, journalism schools, captured you, and forced you to play professional football. <laughs> After fracturing his leg on Sunday, Thomas, an all-pro safety for the Seattle Seahawks, gave the Seattle bench the middle finger as he was driven off the field on a cart. Thomas is bitter the Seahawks refused to give him a third new contract before this season. He set out all of training camp before reporting to work and skipped multiple practices during the first month of the season. Earl Thomas believes football has been unfair to him. Really? Is there another profession that would pay Earl $50 million before age 30? Even with a broken leg ending this 2018 season, I bet Earl can earn another 10 to 25 million in the NFL before his career ends. I'm supposed to believe Earl is some sort of victim of the NFL exploitation? Stop it. Earl, like a lot of players, is caught up in the media-driven delusion that the NFL is this evil, racist institution that takes advantage of its entertainers. Yeah, Earl thinks he's in the music industry. He thinks he's Little Wayne and that Seattle owner Paul Allen is Birdman. <laughs> or maybe Earl is old school. Maybe he thinks he's Ice Cube and Paul Allen is Jerry Heller. My point is, if Earl Thomas wants to know what exploitation looks like in the entertainment industry, he needs to look at the music industry in Hollywood. It took four years for Lil Wayne to drop the Carter Five because Cash Money Records treated him like a slave. It's a common practice in the music industry. Mm. Suge Knight hung vanilla ice over a balcony. Earl, have you ever heard of the Hollywood casting couch? Mm. I don't even have to leave the sports world to look at the Look at, just look at combat sports and how fighters constantly complain about the power promoters wield over them and their paychecks. But damn, I'm glad y'all set it off. Used to be hard, but now you're just wet and soft, looking like straight bozos. I saw it coming, that's why I went journo. Oh, oh so Fat <laughs> Joe is Ice Cube now, huh? That's who you are? <laughs> I am Ice Cube. Sometimes you gotta serve it straight, no chase. Mm. Only way they can hear you. Earl Thomas is no victim. The modern-day business of football is relatively fair, even without guaranteed contracts. Most of you, Marcellus, don't understand the industry you work in. Hmm. You're not allowed to study your profession in school. You play your profession, but you don't remotely understand its nuances. You let the politically-driven mainstream media guide most of your thoughts. They want you to hate football and believe all ownership is morally bankrupt, so you do. You left college at 21 or 22 and walked into an industry that treats its best and brightest like royalty. You earn millions, you barely have to practice anymore. The league has made hard hits virtually illegal. A bunch of old football players believed in something and sacrificed everything so that modern NFL players could be at the top of the sports food chain. Act like a man, show a little gratitude and respect the game that has made you rich beyond your wildest dreams. All right, Marcellus, mm. that's how I see it yeah. as a journalist wannabe rapper. <laughs> I, I saw that. <laughs> Definitely wannabe. <laughs> wannabe rapper. How do you see it as an athlete? Wow, man. Uh, it's crazy, but I got the unpopular opinion. I guess I've been around you too long. Because I agree <laughs> with you, man. It's crazy. I used to have these contentious arguments in the locker room with all the players who, at the moment of signing a contract like Earl Thomas did, four years, $40 million, you're the highest paid safety in the world. And I'm like, don't forget that moment when you're not the highest paid safety in the world, but you're still playing like one. Because there is an honor system that the players want the owners to play by, but they don't even want to participate in. Four years, $40 million means I'm going to give you $40 million if you play for four years under these terms. So uh, let me give you a rap reference. Let's go to Tupac, you know, one of the greatest of all time, and Earl Thomas I'm sure is a fan of. Uh, Tupac once said, you might be deep in this game, but you got the rules missing. And that's the thing about Earl Thomas right now. He's deep in the game, one of the best safeties we've seen ever at that position. 
but you got the rules missing. When you're talking to these owners, the other side of a negotiating, negotiation table and dictating terms, not acting like a franchise player, threatening to retire before, and in a situation like this, it seems like you want them to say, if I overachieve, pay me more. If I'm getting old or I get injured like I did yesterday, still take care of me. What person on the other side of the table is going to sign off on those terms? No one <clears throat> is going to sign off on those terms. And what I think Earl Thomas is caught up in, he does the long game in terms of he has established himself as a Hall of Fame level player. Big time. Won a Super Bowl, participated in a second. The, the NFL, as much as people want to beat it up, they take care of their best and brightest. If you contributed to Super Bowls, again, it, it's like Eric Diggerson came on and has came out and said, hey, uh, Hall of Famers need to be paid X, Y, and Z. The Los Angeles Rams take really good care of Eric Diggerson. He's an advisor, gets cut a check, monthly block. Earl Thomas has all that sitting in front of him as a former Seattle Seahawk. I don't understand why there has to be this hostility because the, the, the Seattle Seahawks don't want to give him financially moving forward what he wants when he turns 30 years old. It's just a business decision. There's no reason for this level of animosity other than the fact, I'm telling you, the media has convinced everybody hate the NFL and they're just exploiting, exploiting you and taking advantage of you. And it's just not true, Marcellus. No, it's not true. And I hate to sound like company man because that was what my teammates used to call me when I said this. But I played under the same rules and never had this issue and played with some guys who were greater than me who didn't even have this same issue. I'll give you a case of point. Two things happened to me when I was at the peak of my powers. And there was a day yeah. when I was at the peak of my oh, powers. And it's crazy. I didn't deserve what I was getting, but you know what? That's what the market dictated. That's what I was worth. So this is what happened. In the same year, I became the highest paid franchise player in Chargers history. Except there's a junior Seau on that same team. And junior, I'm thinking, may have a problem with this. Junior had no problem with that at all. He said, buddy, you're balling, and look at your birth certificate. You're younger than me, so you're going to get yours. And at the same time, Bruce Smith, the greatest of all time at my same position, had no problem with it. He's like, hey, man, I know I'm better than you, and I'm a walking Hall of Famer. You're not, but I still have no issues with it. Frustration is just the anger that's displaced. And what you're seeing from Earl Thomas and others is because they're not getting what they want, what they're wanting, that anger is going to show, that frustration is going to show, because they know they can't stand solid ground and talk to an owner in a way that's going to make the owner cave. So they act it out in the ways we're seeing. The other issue I have with Earl Thomas is he came into this season and last season he went over and told the Cowboys, hey, trade for me. I yeah. want to get here. And I'm, I'm from Texas, and I want to get back to Texas. I want to play for the Cowboys. Hey, I, it's, it's just a bad negotiating strategy, Marcellus. Mm -hmm. If you tell everybody here at Fox I'd rather be at ESPN, they're going to be less likely to pay you. Exactly. They want, when they start handing out, and again, this is like the responsibility that you accept, when they start handing you seven-figure contracts, man, they want to feel the love. Yeah. They want to feel like you appreciate that because the people in power actually know, like, hey, man, everybody doesn't get to live this life, and we're granting you this privilege. You've earned it, but we're the ones cutting the check. And if we feel no appreciation from you, if you're not loyal to us in any way, and again... Earl Thomas is not your – he's not a special teams player. He's not a marginal starter. He's a guy Seattle actually is committed to, and that's why they've given him $50 million over the first eight, nine years of his career. So, uh, again, he can claim the NFL has no love for the players and they're careless. That may be the guys that are special teams and marginal starters, but they actually do care about guys like Earl Thomas and reward them – Generous. Yeah, look, you always get rewarded in the NFL for two things, production or potential. And we get it. There's been times where young players have gotten too much money, a Jimmy G all the way down to a Matt Stafford straight out of college. You're like, that's too much money, but you're rewarding potential as well. Here's the thing that Earl Thomas has to respect, that being a franchise player doesn't mean you have to be just a quarterback. Franchise players, based on what we give you and what we invest in you. So when you're a franchise player, these are some of your duties. 
when the owner's grandchild comes to the locker room, I don't give a damn if you're getting dressed or not. <laughs> Shake his hand, take that picture, okay? It also means when we go into the community and we meet all the CEOs and, and we're doing our marketing strategy and selling season tickets, need you at the head table with a smile, just making sure everyone feels good about supporting this organization. It sounds crazy, but this really boils down to professionalism. When you're under terms, I understand, let's speak quietly about changing these terms. But like you said, those tactics and flirting with another franchise, that's not gonna make me any more eager to try and go out there and help you. Last thing I'll say on this is, it, 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 he chose a bad strategy. Yeah, yeah, it, big time. Go the Le'Veon Bell strategy if that's what's in your heart. I thought Tony Dungy said this well on Football Night in America in terms of like, he analogized this a bit to Vontae Davis. And you know, Vontae quit on his team, and here's a guy acting like he hates the Seattle Seahawks, and I'm giving him the finger as I'm leaving the field. It's like, hey, man, if that's the way you felt, man up and do what Le'Veon Bell is doing. Mm -hmm. Le'Veon Bell, and we'll get to this later in the show, his value keeps going up. Yeah. Keeps going. He's actually improving his situation, in my opinion, because the Steelers can't get it done without him, and Vic, uh, Big Ben is no longer Big Ben. He's medium Ben, and they need Bell, and so, you know, he shouldn't have shown up. He should have played it like Le'Veon Bell. To your point, you can't serve two guys. Either hold out, be gangster with it, Le'Veon Bell, or come in and play ball the right way and stay within the confines of the team. He didn't do either. All right, welcome back. Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock. He's Marcellus Wild. Oh, they know. It's time for some big stories. Let's start in Dallas, where the Cowboys got another big game out of Ezekiel Elliott in a win over the Lions yesterday. With Zeke rushing for more than 150 yards and adding four catches for 88 yards and a touchdown, but it was also Dak Prescott's best game of the year, passing for two touchdowns and topping 250 yards for the first time since week 13 last year. Marcellus, mm. was that win more about Dak or Zeke? Oh, it was about Zeke, absolutely. Uh, what you learned is that the Cowboys' uh, offensive meeting room went like this. You know what? There's only one way you're going to win. There's only one way we could put up points is to feed Zeke. And think about it, the games before what we saw yesterday, Zeke didn't get 20 plus carries. Yesterday, 25 carries. Zeke had the most scrimmage yards and the most touches he had this season. That was being force fed. That wasn't by coincidence. So what it did was now allow Dak Prescott to go out there and have a great game. Remember last week when Zeke had 100 plus rushing yards and Dak still struggled. This time, they give you even more of Zeke, and finally, Dak has a good game. Some are saying great game. But that's by, like, 1992 measurements and standards. If, if Dak Prescott is going out there throwing two touchdowns and 250 yards, and we're like, oh, my God, amazing. That's Eric Kramer. That, that's, that's some old way before the new rules and new changes has occurred. To me, it's still about Zeke. If Zeke goes off and has an amazing game, Disagree. Dak can be okay. Disagree. Let me hear it. Let me hear it. The, the Lions have the worst rush defense in football. All right. They had the second best passing defense in football. Did a nice job of slowing Tom Brady down. Zeke was Zeke. But Zeke was what we, again, Zeke was Zeke. Okay. Dak is the guy that actually elevated, made the game-winning throw, that long pass to Zeke. I'll give it to him. But that was a dime mm -hmm. that won that. and decided the game. And so Dak is the guy that elevated and gave the rest of the team confidence. This game was far more about Dak Prescott, who just last week there were people like, hey, man, is – is Zeke jumping off the Dak bandwagon? Are there questions in that locker room and in that organization about is Dak really our long-term quarterback? And again, did he answer that question definitively? No. Yesterday, no. No, thank you. But did he give people confidence like, oh, okay, <laughs> if we do the right thing. Why you sound like Snoop? Oh, okay. <laughs> what do you mean? What, what oh, confidence? Okay. What? If we do the right thing. What? Dak Prescott is, I, I thought, I watched this game uh, start to finish, I thought Dak was near perfection. You, you, I, 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 he near played, perfection, 255 well, yeah, yards, 17 to 27. Will you stop? I didn't. That was an all-time game by Ezekiel Elliott. That was the best game we've seen from any running back from scrimmage this year. It took all of that, like historic implications for Dak to go, meh, good, all right, great. <laughs> like, use Dak, look at the total sample size, the three years, 2016 until now. 
Dak Prescott, this, this is crazy. This is alarming. In today's NFL, has only thrown for three games over 300 yards in three years. Patrick Mahomes already done that twice and is going to do it again probably tonight to make it three in th four games. I'm not even going to go there. Dak has never thrown for four touchdowns or more in any game. Any game ever. And Mr. Trubisky and others, I'm just saying, like, when we give Dak the pass, it's not fair to Ezekiel or to this franchise. And I think the offense finally figured that out, and they fed Zeke. Patrick Mahomes is a rare talent, working with one of the great offensive coaches of all time. Okay. Working with Tyree Hill, one of the fastest receivers. Travis Kelsey, one of the best tight ends. What about uh, Mr. Trubisky? What about Ryan Fitzpatrick a couple times? Like, give me one of those games where I'm just like, yeah, new NFL standards. Not Eric Kramer. Like, give me something. He's giving you nothing that shows you. Know you know Cole Beasley's his top receiver, right? That's not right. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't happen. I mean, that's, that's his top receiver. That's, that's not, not right. his third down possession guy. Let me get a first down. Dez was that's there, though, a couple of those years. And, and Cole Beasley played better than Dez. Dez Bryant, <laughs> the, the, the ghost of Dez Bryant was there for a couple years. True, true. Early on that first year, Dez was there. And da Dak hasn't had the pieces. I don't think he has the right head coach in terms of offensive guru. That performance yesterday provided hope and confidence in Dallas. Mm. That, to me, if I – look, Zeke, we know he's one of the best backs in the league. Preach. The headline in the story is like, Dak restores some confidence, gives us hope in Dallas. Mm. If he can continue to play like that, th look, they're not out of the division. No, they're not. Philadelphia's two, two, two and two. Yeah. I mean, it, Dallas has hope. <laughs> All right, to a big story out of Pittsburgh, where the Steelers continue to struggle this weekend, putting up just 14 points and a loss to the Ravens. Big Ben admitted after the game that he's got to be better, but the team also missed Le'Veon Bell, with James Conner putting up just 19 yards on nine carries. Marcellus, what's the bigger concern for the Steelers? Big Ben's struggles or Le'Veon Bell's absence? Oh, it's Le'Veon Bell's absence. Think about this. Um, when you're playing against a dynamic team like this, we used to call them the tripods. So over the years, we've seen a few tripods. You saw it in Dallas Cowboys when they won three or four championships and they had Troy Aikman, Michael Irvin, and Emmitt Smith. So as a defender, as a D coordinator, you're sitting there like, yeah, you know what? We're going to stack the box and make sure Emmitt doesn't beat us. You just let Troy Aikman throw the ball to Michael Irvin all day. So then you say, oh, okay, we got to play pass defense. This is going to let Emmitt Smith run the ball. So then we played the back-to-back -back champion Denver Broncos. Oh, we're talking about Rod Smith, John Elway, and Terrell Davis. Same formula. You got to stop one, and then you let the other one beat you. So now in Pittsburgh, what they don't have is Le'Veon Bell. So it's no more Big Ben, Antonio Brown, and Le'Veon Bell. Without him there in his absence, all the focus is on Antonio Brown. And Antonio Brown is struggling this year beyond the sideline tantrums. Do you know that, that Antonio Brown has not had a 100-yard receiving game this year? Just think about his level of frustration. And it's only coming from one place, the absence of one Le'Veon Bell. I think there's a lot of merit to what you're saying. You've argued a hell of a case. I'm just going to go back to where the NFL is right now. It's a quarterback league. Yes, true. Everything starts and finishes with the quarterback. And the quarterback's not right here. Big Ben is not the same. He is not aging the way Drew Brees and Tom Brady have aged. Mm. He didn't take care of himself early in his career. He just started a workout regimen during the offseason. <laughs> hey, I'm out in the best shape. It's too little, too late. Yeah. He, the, the shot, and look, man, you talk, I am Big Ben's. Biggest fan. He is, again, I, he's my favorite player in the NFL. Wears number seven like John Elway. Reminds mm -hmm. me of John Elway. Mm -hmm. But he's just not aging well. He, he, he is the problem. He's the maturity problem. He's the on-field problem. His, I, I, he needed an advisor. Because, again, when he started that stuff, like, I'm thinking about retiring and blah, those little veiled threats. Because yeah. I was sitting here on the show when he said that, and I was like, Man, he's BSing. Mm. He's thinking about retiring. He's, he's just trying to make a threat to the Steelers, and, and, and they're not buying it. And now they go out and draft Mason Rudolph, and then he's got a problem with that or whatever. Ben's immature, hasn't handled his career as well as Drew Brees and Tom Brady and some of his contemporaries, and it's falling apart and blowing up on him. Yeah, look, uh, there's a story of Big Ben is not a PR dream. I mean, he's not giving you the proper framework and backdrop 
that supports how good he really is. He's actually better than his story. Uh, even looking at this year and his struggles, you still look at the numbers and you're like, there are three games where you're 350 plus yards. Like, and then there's games where you have too many turnovers and there's games where it's inopportune times. But there are two different conversations because if I'm using the Dak Prescott scale of evaluation that you used last segment, then Big Ben is fine, very good. But we're if, not using the Dak But we are not going to use that right against Big Ben. What Big Ben is realizing is what Antonio Brown has realized. Yo, we need Le'Veon, and we need him now because that's why you saw the success in the dynasties of before. And they had something dynastic. Whether they won all the Super Bowls or not, they've been to two. Uh, they won one, 13 wins last year. Without Le'Veon Bell, they really took a lot away from this offense. I... Le'Veon Bell's value is unquestioned, okay. and they should pay him, in my opinion. Yes. I think he's proven that. I don't think he fixes the Big Ben problem. Really? No, because, again, Big Ben's immaturity keeps showing up no matter who's in the backfield. This has been an ongoing thing for the last two or three years. People have just been making excuses. He has not handled things well all the way down to, and look, I know that Todd Haley can be a bully mm. and annoying and all that. Yes. But I think Todd Haley was the right offensive coordinator. If Ben were in a different mindset of accepting coaching, of bowing to coaching a little bit, and partnering up with an offensive coordinator mm. rather than going to war with one all the time, at some point you have to say to Big Ben, uh, how come every offensive coordinator Tom Brady has had, they've seemed to have some kind of special bond and partnership and friendship and it seems like every coordinator or somebody that works for Big Ben, they're constantly at war. That's on Big Ben. And then you go look over at Todd Haley. He just put 42 points up with the Cleveland Browns. Yeah. I think he's a pretty good offensive coordinator. And, again, I know he can be a bit of a jerk, but some – as a – you know, uh, unfair there because that's result driven. Like when Tom Brady beats with Bill O'Brien and curses him out and all that, we say, oh, but they win the Super Bowl. So that's just passion. But then when you're Big Ben and you lose, but even though you win 13 games, 12 as a starter, and then we see you yell he at the same time. got Todd Haley fired. Yeah, basically. He yeah, he did. And, and, and we just had his buddy promoted offensive coordinator, and they just scored 14 points on Baltimore. Right. And if they would have won last year, won it all, then we sit there and say, you know what? Big Ben knows best. But it's still result-driven. But I get you. His story's not telling the full picture. All right, welcome back. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley. We're joined now by Fox NFL analyst Tony Gonzalez. Let's return to the NFL where the Texans took down the Colts on a last-second field goal in overtime yesterday with a big assist from Colts head coach Frank Wright, who decided to go for it on fourth and four from his own 43-yard line with just 24 seconds left. While the decision clearly cost Indy, Wright stuck to his guns after the game. I thought we had a good drive going there at the end and, and then just came up short. Um, you know, just address it now. I mean, we're not playing to tie. I mean, we're going for that 10 times out of 10. I mean... That's just the way it's got to roll. Love it. Yeah. Again, we're not going to play for a tie. And I think everybody in that locker room freaking likes that. I mean, loves that. I love that. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> this is why football is not played best by intelligent men. Oh. I'm a Ball State graduate. Middle America, common values, Cal Berkeley, Columbia, Stanford. Mm. You guys are too smart and overthink. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> That's where you win. <laughs> That's where you win. Dumb. That's this is why I don't trust players. You co-sign for one of the dumbest decisions in the history of football. You got to punt that ball and take your medicine. No, it wasn't the dumbest decision. It was just a bad result. But the decision comes before the result, and that's what you always get caught up in. You see what happens, and you be like, oh, that was stupid. I was saying it before. I, when he was lining up, are you kidding me? Look, look, I understand, like, you know, you're a gambler also. You yeah. understand what, like, don't double down on, on 12. I will, and, you know, and see what happens. <laughs> and, and, but you know what? I like that mindset. It's daring, and... It beats the alternative. It beats you being passive. It beats you being too cautious. So I respect what he's saying and supporting his a coach. A loss beats a tie. This is what I'm saying. Columbia, <laughs> Ivy League. Let's hear, let's hear from Cal Berkeley. Oh, 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 first of all, I love how Andrew Luck, that was Andrew Luck getting the motion right there. We freaking love it. Like, I, I, was like, I, I bet he's never met a set of cuss word in his life, man. But that was great. But besides uh, that, uh, that, that, but that's what that brings out in a, in a guy like him, the leader of the team, 
Everybody loves it. As a player, me playing tight end, I would have been like, absolutely, let's go for it. I don't want to play for a tie. See? I want to win this football What'd game. What do you think about the loss, Tony? <laughs> it's better than a tie. It's better than a tie. Ooh. I'd rather Ooh. lose yeah. than tie the game. Yeah, take a risk. I'd rather man. go out fighting. Mm-hmm. Come hey, on, Wit. You hey, want to fight, don't you? You don't want to. You don't want to be like, okay, they just. They fought sit. the entire game, and the best result they had in front of them in that situation was a tie. Take the tie. Oh, okay, look, all right. Let's use some intelligence because we know this is a copycat league. And be real, the off season, every single coach sat around and watched Doug Peterson and his daring ways, and sat there and said, oh. And we saw Jacksonville be too cautious in the second half against New England, AFC Championship game. You know what we're going to do? Especially a first-year head coach, former player. Man, I'm going all in every time I can. And I think that's what you saw. You saw everyone saying the new mantra is be risky. Belichick, remember in the Indy game a few years ago, fourth and two on his own 20? Go for it. Like, that's Marcella, the new way of Marcella, coaching. Marcella. Uh, Tony and I were in Kansas City at the same time mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. When Tony was a young star and, you know, good-looking guy, single. <laughs> and remember. Tony used to hang out at this bar called Me Casino, him and oh. Jason Dunn. Oh, yeah. They'd be down in the basement. And occasionally, <laughs> it, I would be there with them. And I'd see how they operated. Mm. That didn't say I could operate like this. <laughs> and so just because Doug Peterson uh, did something, Frank Wright's sitting there going, oh, I can do that too. Yeah. No, you can't. Not on fourth down in that situation with 24 seconds left. You can't do what everybody else does. I, I hear what you're saying, but the, the, the <laughs> gunslinger mentality, and, mm. and, and with like, I think you did have a good time now. I, I think you, you did okay, but don't, don't, don't say do what you could do. Don't say you're <laughs> short. <laughs> but it, I, I, there was also a play in the Cleveland Browns game, and this is where if I was a coach, I probably, they, it was fourth and in inches. Yeah. Remember that one? They got hose on that call. I'm sure you guys probably talked about it. Uh, I was saying, go for it. Mm. Go just an inch. Just do a quarter. But you can't get a half an inch. Yeah. Go for it. You saw what happened. They punted it down. They came back and, and they ended up winning. Sorry about that. They ended up winning the game. Uh, I, I, I like that mentality of being aggressive. I'd rather be aggressive than lose than play it safe and and tie or, or tie. Yeah, it's about that process. We're like you got to understand. Like sometimes, even being a parent, you're like. There are times where you're like, oh, I shouldn't let my son do that because that's not the best thing for this moment. But you know what? I don't want to take that will out of him. I don't want to take that risk out of him because it could pay dividends going forward. I think that's one of those situations. Like, success is not linear. You know, there are times where you're going to go backwards to go forward. This may have been a bad result, but it's the proper mindset you need. Do you leave the stove on at home? Back burner uh only because he can't reach it, but yeah. So you leave look the stove on. <laughs> no, leave no, the no, no, on. Hey, look, he can burn his hands. But that's part of the learning process. Yeah, learn. Those fourth degree burns all over his hands. He'll degree. recover from He'll that. Recover. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> let, just let him learn. They took an L when they didn't have to. And at the end of the day, the NFL is about wins and losses. Can you avoid the losses? Can you get some wins? They hadn't a chance to avoid a loss here. He made a dumb decision. Everybody caping up and defending, oh, it's aggressive, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. No, it's the kind of stuff that will get you fired at some point. And if he doesn't learn, he, he put his hand up there and touched the stove, and we need to be, t yeah, it's hot up there, don't mm. do it again, rather than Andrew Luck and all you other smart guys with high SAT scores telling him it's the right thing to do. Football's a simple game, man. You punt on fourth and four. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's all you do? It's a simple game. Okay. Mm. Punt, play field. Remember learn Marty that. Schottenheimer? Field position football. Back. Yeah. That's how you win games. Nobody yeah. does it. That's yeah. boring. It's boring. <laughs> yeah. Let's move to Trust Green me. Bay, where the Packers' defense was the star yesterday, shutting out the Bills in a 22-0 win, but even that didn't do much to satisfy Aaron Rodgers, who went off after the game about the team's performance on the other side of the ball. Well, we were terrible on offense. It was as bad as we played on offense with that many yards in a long time. I mean, we were championship defensive level and uh, non-playoff team offensive level today. That was uh, not great uh, by any stretch of the imagination. We need to find ways to get our playmakers in, our, in position to get some more opportunities. When you say you got to find ways to get those guys the ball, is that, how, how is that done? How do you do that? Is that by play selection? Is that by reads? What, what is, how does that happen? It's by the plan. Find ways to get him in number one spots. All right, Aaron Rodgers, to mm. me, is taking a little shot at Mike McCarthy uh, here. Uh, you know, I think some of it has to do with the running back position. They're playing running back by, uh, by committee, and there's a young running back, I think Aaron Jones, that 
Aaron Rodgers would like to see on the field more and get more touches. I think he was suspended for the first two games, but then in the third and fourth games, he, he was used in a committee way that might, uh, that Aaron Rodgers doesn't like. I, I, I'm going to somewhat defend Mike McCarthy somewhat and just say Green <coughs> Bay has a personnel issue. Always has. They don't go out and surround Aaron Rodgers with the best players. And, and so the coach's hands are tied to some degree. However, having said that, uh, the expiration date may have reached its point with mm. between the Mike McCarthy, Aaron Rodgers marriage. You know what? Not only do they have a personnel issue, they always have a personality issue too. Like you think about it, let's keep this 100. From day one, it's always something, and there's always a problem in Green Bay since Aaron Rodgers been there. Let's be real. Like, pre-draft, he dropped in the draft. People were saying that was personality-based. Whatever it is, he dropped unnecessarily, but he did. He gets to Green Bay, first thing is he can't get along with Brett Favre, whether that's him or that's Brett Favre. Somehow, some way, he didn't show deference or reverence, or Brett Favre didn't extend the hand down to the young and up-and-coming, but somehow, some way, that didn't go well. Then, all of a sudden, you see him out there, and immediately, we're like, whoa. He's the best. And then we're like, okay, we're going to just ride that. Oh, he got a Super Bowl. But it, he's the best. He deserves more. He should get more. And then that's when the pressure kicks in. And all of a sudden, all the fingers start pointing. Whether he's getting hurt or he's like, this is not the proper team. This is not the proper personnel. I don't like my running backs. I don't like my receiving core. Oh, you're not keeping the players I want. Oh, the defense is not good enough. Like, every single year, if you start to add up the headlines, there's always something there in Green Bay. And I just think it just circles around the fact that He's feeling that pressure of being the best, but not getting the best results. So Mike McCarthy, once again, will be the scapegoat like everything else has been, but it's not on Mike McCarthy. Yeah, and, and that's kind of where I would love Aaron Rodgers to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything that he was saying, at least point it at, at yourself, at least a little bit. And be like, hey, well, I got to play better, too. I got to hit guys coming out of their break or whatever. He didn't throw a perfect game. I mean, and, and, I, and absolutely, he is taking a shot at Mike McCarthy. Oh, yeah, I don't, I, with, Without a doubt there, yeah. he is saying something is going on. But that is Aaron Rodgers. He, I don't, you guys, I don't know if you ever met him in person. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. He is an, an intense guy. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he – whether it's because he's developed a chip on his shoulder, but he's not trying to impress you. He don't care. He's just like, hey, I'm here, and he knows how good he is. He knows he's the best quarterback, one of the best quarterbacks of all time. He feels like he's in a position he can say whatever he wants to say because that, that's, that's tough to do. Like, I don't know, as the face of your franchise, to come out and say he knows what – he's a smart – he's a Berkeley guy. He knows what's coming after this. Uh, I, I'm surprised that he would do something like that, but I think he, the window's closing in his career. He's got You're about right. what, three, four more years, and he wants to win another Super Bowl. And he feels like he's not being surrounded and the right plays aren't getting called. Uh, but point the finger at yourself, too. Say we're in this together. Y'all make some fascinating points. And having played for a long time in Kansas City, having played in Buffalo, when I hear you all talk, I'm starting to think big fish in little pond. Mm. He's playing in Green Bay. He's the only attraction in Green Bay. What a cheese is the, is the <laughs> other thing. Cheese, cheese curds. Cheese, cheese, cheese curds. curds. Cheese curds. <laughs> and so. He has so much leverage and power being mm. that kind of superstar in Green Bay that maybe he never does have to question himself because he's the greatest thing in Green Bay, in Wisconsin. Yeah, it, it sounds a little drunk on your own power. Let's just be real. I mean, I've played with guys who had the same level of power but didn't act like that, didn't say those type of things, and the storyline didn't continue every single year where it's the surrounding parts. Like you said, Tony, even in greatness, even in – you playing as well as you have, Aaron Rodgers, it's not perfection. So uh, the, I thought the great quarterbacks can overcome some of these ills and issues surrounding them. Tom Brady certainly does every single year. And maybe he's having that kind of mental tug of war with his greatness. And therefore, I'm not the problem. I'm the best at it. It has to be something surrounding me. Is there a different mentality than playing in Kansas City as opposed to a major city like Atlanta? Uh, Being a star in those cities. It, it, mentality is, as far as what, though? I don't, less con I don't know if there's other superstars in Atlanta, yeah. other people on your level in Atlanta. When you were in Kansas City, you know, you and Derek Thomas, and that was pretty much it. Well, you feel the pressure to, to, to perform more in Kansas City, the smaller town, because that, that's all they had. <laughs> we, mm -hmm. we were the only thing in town. The Royals weren't good back right. then. Uh, where in Atlanta, you got everything going on. You got, you, you see, Famous people out having lunch all the time. It's a big music. So you just, like you said, big fish in a little pond. 
uh, you're, a, you're a big fish in a big pond. There's other big fish out there. So you felt the pressure uh, of carrying the city and the hopes and dreams of the city. Because when we did well, they did well. You know, everybody was happy. All right, welcome back. Marcellus and I are joined now by Fox NFL analyst D'Angelo Hall. As you know, I'm a journalist. And we've got our resident Ivy Leaguer, Marcellus, here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put on our thinking caps and take a deeper look at some big issues in sports. We've got a special cap for the Columbia grad. Ah, yes. Darnell, bring it on in. Oh, huh? Uh, <laughs> sorry you had to put up with this, D'Angelo. This dude thinks he's special. Because <laughs> he graduated from an Ivy League. <clears throat> I, I didn't hear rather you, Rather than Jason. a real school. Uh, all right, let's, let's move to football. Where things are looking mighty soft these days, fellas, we've, got, we've already seen a ton of questionable roughing the passer calls this year, and things might be getting worse with the Steelers' Juju Smith-Schuster actually making a Ronaldo-like flop against the Ravens last night. But it's not just the NFL that's got me worried. On Saturday, people were up in arms after Jimbo Fisher grabbed one of his players by the face mask to scold him after an on-field scuffle. Despite the backlash, Jimbo didn't seem to think it was a big deal. The cameras caught an interaction between you and Tyrell where you were grabbing him by the face mask. And what kind of what was what was behind that interaction? Yeah, they were getting an interaction right there out and getting in a, they're getting an argument in a fight. Well, I don't, need, I don't need that guy out there pushing and shoving, getting in a fight in the game. And then a game like that to lose 25. And I was just trying to make a point. I, I just I don't want you out there fighting and make the play, shut your mouth, go on. Uh, I see this as no big deal. I was shocked. Over social media, I saw a good friend of mine, Bucky Books, call what Jimbo did assault. Love you, Bucky, but that's too much. I just, th this whole softening of football is disconcerting and concerning for me. Uh, one of my seminal moments in life was uh, Tony Burchett, who was an assistant high school football coach at the time. He later became our superintendent of schools, but he called me the P word on the first day of practice, mm. of varsity football practice my sophomore year, mm. out in front of everybody. And I was a freshman that was supposed to be this very good player, and the dude called me the P word, and I was like, oh, that'll never happen again. Right. And it never happened again. Mm -hmm. And it, it turned, it, I would have never gotten a football scholarship had he not verbally abused me, and I'm sorry, maybe I'm just some old fool, but it takes iron to sharpen iron, and we want to take all the iron out of football. I, I don't like it. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I I'm going to say two different things, but one, let me just blanket statement. I'm in support of football getting quote-unquote softer. I'm going to say that. Now, I also had it no... It like a knife. Man. It hurts you, huh? <laughs> hot, hot knife, too. <laughs> Warm butter. <laughs> Cut. But I also had no problem with either one of these incidents in, one, in this altercation. Look, I've been the guy who's been grabbed by the face mask, been the guy who's been cursed out. Uh, but I also respected that discipline is like a form of punishment to actually protect you from greater punishments down the line. So I'm getting in your face right now because something worse can come from this if I don't stop you right now and get your full attention. But in terms of football getting too soft, I'll let, I'll let you talk first, D'Angelo. But in, in, in totality, I'm in support. I didn't walk into football tough. I walked out tough. But I did understand while going through that process of 25 years of football, it was some unnecessaries in terms of the toughness aspect and the bravado and machismo. Too much. I, I, I totally think football is becoming too soft. You look at Jimbo there, that's how we were raised playing football. Like, I, I, I wasn't always a nice guy. I was a little mean little, little turd growing up. <laughs> right. And in order to, 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 to play some of that turdness, you know, <laughs> uh, you know as far as letting it off in positive ways, football was that outlet for me. It allowed me to be physical. Even though I was a smaller smaller kid, I still was aggressive. And so, you know, I think we're totally taking football to a point to where it's not football. If me as a kid, if I couldn't hit people the way I thought that I wanted to playing football, as these rules are showing us now, I don't know if I'd have chosen football to keep playing. But there are so many ways that we see legal hits in the proper targeting areas that are vicious. No like, sellers. I mean, you can still knock someone's head off Man, and, no, and not knock their head off. Like, you there's still a way to send that message. As a defensive player, especially a secondary player, mm. if I have a receiver, they already know where they're going. I don't know where I'm going. I'm going backwards. The only line of defense that I have to really make this dude fear me is to hit him. Right. 
I want my safety. Back in the day, when you were coming across the middle, we told our safeties, knock his head off. When I finally got a safety like Lawyer Malloy when I was in Atlanta, he was knocking heads off. Dudes didn't want to run across the middle no more. Yeah, but you sound privileged right now, and this is what I used to all Privileged? Privileged. You know why? Because I'm going to get, like, Jason, you on my side, but I'm talking about even at the next level. I played in the trenches. Now, my entire life up until pro level, I was a running back, kick returner. Then I just kept getting bigger, and they were like, you're, gonna, you're only going to make it to the NFL if you play D-line. Uh -huh. And then... I went to the trenches. Mm -hmm. And you know this, because even in a practice that's abbreviated, shells don't even go out in pads. It was hell to pay, even when we were not padded and protected on the O-line and D-line. He's one of those privileged guys that they get to select when they go into the fire. And I don't care what DB you tell me, I don't care what cornerback you tell me, it's not the same game that is when you're down there every single play, that other dude's 300 plus pounds, and that's what you have to do 70, Mar 80 times. Marcellus, though, there's a lot of players that you wouldn't even know their names if you talk about Hall of Famers and great players that you would even... If they tried to play in today's NFL, they would not... They wouldn't be able to play. Don't think they could learn the new Heck, way? No, I don't think they could play. Part of Ronnie Lott's game was to knock people's heads off. Mm -hmm. Part of Steve Atwater and these big-time safeties that played the game the hard way play the game the right way at the time, John Lynch. These guys would never have been successful in the National Football League because their game wasn't built on speed. Their game wasn't built on interceptions. Their game was built on being physical and physically imposing, imposing their will on, on their opponents. Even the yeah. great Sean Taylor, he would not have been, I mean, he probably could have adjusted because Sean was able to do a lot of different things. But part of the reason Randy Moss hated playing Sean Taylor is because he always made it personal with Randy because he knew Randy was the best. I'm going to hit this dude. D'Angelo, are you frat? Are you in a Greek fraternity? No, I'm not. Okay. No. Neither are you, Marcel. Okay. No. I, this is what I've always analogized football to. It's the hard, college football. Mm -hmm. It's the hardest four or five years of pledging that you'll go through. Hmm. And it, it's, you know, pledging, I think now they got it in the Greek fraternities down to about four weeks. It used to be 12, 16 yeah. weeks, whatever. Mm -hmm. College football was a four or five year play. It wasn't for everybody. No. A lot of guys dropped line because mm -hmm. they could. <laughs> after four years, I dropped line. I could have played a fifth, but I dropped line. It's like, I've had enough. Yeah. It's not for everybody. But that four years that I did survive is one of the reasons why I've been successful afterwards. There's virtually nothing that could happen to me in this profession that would ever make. You think I'm going to quit? Yeah. Really? Yeah. After what I, I know what. I've been tested so many different ways through football. There's nothing that could happen out here in this real world that could ever touch me, and I think we're losing that. I mean, I went to Ball State's practice this year, and I, I was so out of the loop. I was like, hold on, they don't practice two a days during the summer? Mm -hmm. they, no. Two, no, no two no, a days? Well NFL is different. Now. <laughs> you can't, you can't yeah. go back to All types back. of things going on. It's too wet outside. Oh, it's too hot outside. It's this, it's that. It's definitely creating a different culture. You talked about just being able to to take on the world when you, you know, when you left. We always say that these, this generation is soft. It's because they are. Oh, man, it's stop. Because it's not overgeneralizing. It, oh, it's the truth. Are you so kidding me? You guys watch football. I was at a football game yesterday. And if you're going to tell me that that's a soft product, what we're seeing out there, you're comparing it to maybe the, the barbaric era, which even then, I know a coach in private per coach that I play for with the 10-inch ACL scar who could barely walk sits there not on the podium, not when he's telling everyone, tough talking, go football. When he's sitting there saying for real, he's like, that was unnecessary. We didn't, we didn't have to go through those well, processes to get tough. Then. Uh, uh, you talked about then and all I'm the players of that from, era. I'm just talking from 2000 to where we are now. I'm not even talking about... I'm just saying some of the players, even further back than that, if you tried to put them up in, in this, in today's NFL, and ask them to abide by the rules and, and can't hit a guy here and do that, and They're not I don't know if they would be anymore. successful. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Let, let me... Here's my problem, Marcellus. And look, I, I get safety. I'm not, I, I do want everybody to be safe. And, and, and I get you it. You sure? Uh, yes, I <laughs> okay. do. But to some degree. I, look, hear, I knew it. A life without risk is, is a life worth not living. I, I wouldn't want to live a life that took no risk. But when I see Juju Smith Schuster flopping around like on a soccer field, mm -hmm. when I see Big Ben get tapped in the head and fall to the ground and fake an injury and things like that, it repulses me. I don't, that's, I, that's not football, that's soccer. And there's a reason why I grew up a football fan and it's taken me time
to enjoy soccer and I'll never have the passion for it because the risks just aren't that great. The higher the risk, the higher the reward. We're taking all of the risk out and now these players understand like the culture's changing. And so let me go out here and fake an injury. Let me go flop around like they do in soccer, you like we've like seen in basketball. The game, C.J. Beathard got knocked out the game, came back, but got knocked out legally. And guess what? He took a risk. And, and, and the risks are still there. People are still getting knocked out. People are still having season-ending injuries. What's crazy is there's a manipulation of the rules that's happening, and it went from soccer to basketball. And now, now guys... It's in football. And, and now it's in football. And people are saying you're soft. After, some would say you're smarter because you're doing gamesmanship. I'm sure behind closed Man, doors, you're sitting there saying now, there was a day, do you remember the so day when they told every running back, if, if you don't run out, if, 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 if you don't get that extra yard, if you run out of bounds, you soft. I remember hearing that as a Franco running back. Harris. Yeah, no, yeah, like, Franco Harris. What? He loved I, this league. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm about to die for one more yard, and then Jimmy G gets caught up in y'all talk. Oh, I'm going to get that extra nah, yard. That and look what happens to do with being you. soft. Right out of bounds, you're a quarterback. I'm cool with that. And, and even running backs went through the same kind of mental dynamic in the battle. To me, this is where the game's going. Protect your assets quarterbacks on down. D'Angelo, you still would have been a good player. This is the thing, though, man. They're not necessarily trying to protect their assets. They're trying to protect themselves. The NFL, this is just what the NFL is trying to do so that they're, they aren't 15, 20 years down the road paying, paying out more lawsuits, more right. CTE uh, studies, more uh, bodily harm issues and things like that. This, a, this has nothing to they're do with... They're catering to people that yeah, don't like that's, football. That's all opinion. they're doing. Y'all acting like... like any, I, I don't know the player. you you rather play in your era than an a, a era that you call in soft right now. You couldn't make the adjustment to play right well, now. Well, you know what, Marcel? I'm a DB and a corner. So for me, when I, when I, when I played my last two years at safety, it, it, it wasn't that hard for me because I, I'm, I'm not a killer banger that's coming down trying to knock people's heads off. I was trying to get the ball. Mm -hmm. So for me, my game, my, my game was made to, to do, any, I mean, you know, to play physical, to play kind of soft, but I'm just Gotta looking go. at the totality of everyone else playing the game. And, you know, Especially my we safeties. We gotta go. Yeah. D'Angelo, you were much smarter than Marcellus. <laughs> so was I. All right, welcome back. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley. Tony Gonzalez and D'Angelo Hall are back. Let's return to Earl Thomas, whose feud with the Seahawks appears to have ended about as badly as it could have, with the all pro safety fracturing his leg and likely going out for the year. Thomas was so upset about how it all played out. He actually appeared to give his own sideline the middle finger as he was being carted off the field. All right, I started out the show talking about this, Tony and, and D'Angelo, that I don't like it. I, I don't like this animosity that so many guys seem to have towards the NFL uh, that's over the top. The guys made $50 million before age uh, 30. Uh, I think you got to show a little bit more respect and gratitude towards the league. Again, he's earned it but there's just not a lot of professions for 29-year-olds to make $50 million in the first seven, eight years of their career. Let, let's tamp down this over-the-top animosity towards the NFL. Yeah, I echo what you said earlier as well. Um, it's a lack of professionalism, it feels like to me. Uh, you know, I'm not mad at Earl Thomas, but, you know, as they say, don't hate the player, hate the game. And the game that you play is a non-guaranteed contract sport where you can't put in asterisk and say, oh, but pay me if I overachieve or if I'm getting old or if I get injured because you can cut me anytime you want to. That's the rules. That's the game we play. When you sign for the richest contract at safety in NFL history, guess what? It also said in fine print, it's a one-way street. We can get, let you go, but you can't demand of us something that we don't want to give you unless with mutual ah. respect. But you can, my friend. Oh, go on, listen. You've uh -oh. seen Julio Jones do it. If you have the leverage, you can do it. And Earl thought he had the leverage. He really did. He thought he had the leverage. And I thought he had the leverage, especially with this Legion of Boom being broken up. I thought they would for sure get that deal done. But they didn't. Mm -hmm. They stuck to their guns. And so Earl, he came in. He came in. He went to work. I probably wouldn't have. A lot of people are so down on Le'Veon Bell. But... Le'Veon Bell is picking a stance, and he's sticking with it. 
is part of the reason he's not out there right now is because he said, look, at the end of the day, you guys are going to throw me away. You're going to give me to another team or trade me or whatever. I'm going to hit free agency. I'm not playing for y'all. So my allegiance isn't to you right now. It's not to get 400 carries for you or 400 touches for you. It's for myself. And so I'm going to come in at the last possible time that I can come in, still get my credit this season and hit free agency. I think Earl absolutely should have done that. But Earl being the bigger person wanting to help his team, he suffers. His family suffers. And yeah, Whit, he made a lot of money. He absolutely did. He's a great player. I don't blame Earl because I feel the same way. I wanted to flip the bird at the house watching the game <laughs> because that man went out there and sacrificed it and put it on the line for that for his teammates. And they gave him $50 million over those eight years. <laughs> they gave him four years, yeah. 40. Y'all they did, over, and right? he should have made more than that. Yeah, but what have you done for me lately? It's the okay. last year in his contract. Now he's injured, hitting free agency. Well, no, no player wants that. I, I don't think, you know, no, look, no, I don't blame him for being angry. I think when you look at it. Angry I mean, at who? At, I don't blame him for being angry at the situation. You look at the look in his eyes. He, th his nightmare just came through. Mm -hmm. came, mm -hmm. You saw a man have his worst nightmare happen. And he was frustrated, and he was angry. He probably felt Who's like fault? yelling. It is it more than likely it's his fault. He was mad at himself. Right. Should he have flipped Get that sideline off? Absolutely not. That was ridiculous and uncalled for. Right. You got kids watching. You got young players watching. I just, I, I, but I understand. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get it now. He, he was frustrated, and it it just that's how you react though when you imagine your first nightmare. A lot coming. worse. No, yeah. in, in, it in, just cost in, in not as severe of situations. He just uh, lost millions of dollars. Wait, exactly. That's why he's flipping off that and side. That's what we're I don't think he's it's lost millions long of dollars. Security, he broke though. his leg. You yeah. right. He's, he'll, he'll he's gonna back, recover. He'll come yeah. back from but this. He's not gonna. But at some point, at some point, the injuries just don't allow you to be the same player. No question. And then you know what, too, with you, you, what you got to take into consideration. Think about his teammate, Cam Chancellor, a guy he came into this league Who's with. still getting paid by Because by the he had a great agent mm -hmm. that got that deal done, or Cam would have went out there in the last year of his deal, got that neck injury, and nothing. But see, we're Cam still is on this list. You're, we're talking unfortunate players. circumstances, nightmares. No, we're talking but football. Then, but, but guess what? Who are you mad at is the conversation. It's, we get it. Football has taken – there's been guys who have been projected first-rounders, pull their hamstring in the combines, next thing you know, they drop to the fifth round. Like, this nightmare that we're talking about happens all the time. Guys get injured on contract years. But who are you flipping the bird at? Is it really displaced aggression? And you really flipping it at yourself like you said. And he, so here's my stuff. point, D'Angelo and, and Tony. It's just like, I just think – there's this undercurrent of animosity towards the NFL. It's unfair. It exploits. It and some of that may have all been true. But now this modern-day NFL, when, when you're a good player, man, you're getting paid a lot of money. Nah, you are. He's not Little Wayne up against Birdman and Cash Money <laughs> Records. You're right. That's where the exploitation and the slavery was intact. Yeah, you're right. It took him... Four years to put an album out. If y'all, if football players go look at the rest of the entertainment industry mm. and look at the exploitation that goes on that's real and really damaging. Lil Wayne was damaged. Yeah. Uh, go ask any of these Hollywood actresses about the casting couch. Yeah. That's damage. Earl Thomas got 50 million. He's gonna come back from this injury and probably make another 10 to 25 million in the NFL. I'm not gonna shed a bunch of tears for him. And the craziest part about it all is not just what you've made, but what you can still make, but you just made some organizations say, not necessarily the behavior of a franchise player. We always think franchise player means the quarterback. No, it's like whoever we're highly invested in, and this NFL, to Jason's point, is paying even players that we don't think are good. Like, when Jimmy G got paid, everyone was like, whoa. Like, there's a way that you can hit it and have leverage and get paid without even a great tenure of work. So he didn't play that one. All right, welcome back. All right, Marcellus, you know I can't stand what's going on out there in social media land. Y'all my lawn. So we've got our social media manager, Darnell Smith, here to convince me it's not so bad. Mm. Darnell. What's going on, Jay <laughs> Wayne? What? Darnell, what you got? Uh, I 
I brought my helmet out. I wanted to be a part of the Thinking Cap segment today. <laughs> I mean, is it, is it, does this work? Is this good enough? Or? Take that off. Yeah, I love please, it. Please. I love it. Take that off. Oh, man. That will oh, not man. get you in the Thinking Cap segment. Mess your waves up. Try. We'll get you a free oh, lunch man. this week at some point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what you got? Yeah, let's start out in California, hmm. where Niners fans held their breath when Jimmy G's replacement, C.J. Beathard, yeah. got the win out of them in the fourth quarter. And third stringer Nick Mullins started warming up. The Southern Miss product and practice squad all-star has no NFL resume, leading our guy Marcellus to tweet, Nick Mullins? <sighs> Kaepernick line one. <laughs> Marcellus, do you really believe this? Or are you just doing it for the likes? Uh, well, one, I was doing it fully motivated by that hydration situation. I was about 20 in. No, just kidding. Uh, uh, look, you were thirsty for likes is what you were thirsty, thirsty for. Thirsty for likes? You stop that. Um, uh, his lawyer says some teams are interested. I was just making sure another one was paying attention. Nick Mullins? Like, when I you type, to say. type in Nick <laughs> Mullins, you hit me with the whole can. Type Twitter in Nick off. Mullins and see what comes up. Next, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. Come to say on, man. Nothing. And uh, he didn't get the wind knocked out of him because I got that wind knocked out of me before. You usually grab he your was, stomach. That's true. <laughs> he grabbed his head, bro. All right, now. Can we move on? I, <laughs> yeah. Can we move on? You ain't we right. Let's move on to Oakland, where it looked like the Browns had their second straight win wrapped up after getting a first down late in the fourth quarter, but the refs overturned it, mm. leading to a Cleveland punt and a Raiders comeback. Browns fans were pretty upset about the call online including the Cleveland Police Department, who tweeted, robbery warrant issue for tonight's Browns game for NFL's officials. Okay, we can't do that, but just saying. <laughs> what do you guys sign with here, the rest or 5-0? I, I, I side with the police here. This is exactly how you should use Twitter. This is funny. Can we go back and show this highlight again of the, of the run? Because I want to show you something that's, that, that's not being talked about. Hmm. This yellow line that we use to indicate first downs, Right there, it's on the other side of the 19. Yeah. They show it later, and it's on the other side of the 19. And so the ref comes out and says, he, the runner didn't reach the 19-yard line. Well, depending on which angle you saw of the yellow line and where they placed it, mm. it was actually short of the 19. This was criminal highway robbery. <laughs> This was wrong. Hugh well, Jackson and the Browns. What? Got well articulated done. argument, yeah. but you picked the wrong person. Like th the yellow line is based on the networks and technology. Yeah, right. And they got nothing to do with the NFL officials. The officials got it right. His, Replay. His elbow. His elbow landed before he crossed the first down marker. And I'm talking about the old school one with the chains on it. Yeah. I'm not talking about whatever network put that out there in terms of a yellow line. Fox, our network, network, network. So no. Don't get caught up in the yellow line because that's not accurate. It's that's on not the proof field beyond a shadow of a doubt. The refs should have been found not guilty. First down, Cleveland. No way that call should have been. And removed. an arrest warrant, according to you. Cleveland police get a nice job. That's how you use Twitter. I wish more people use Twitter. That it's good natured fun. <laughs> yeah, right. Love that. All right. All right. What you got, Darnell? What's yeah, let's next? move to this Bucks and Bears game where Jameis Winston made his season debut after Ryan Fitzmagic turned back into a pumpkin in the first half. Mm. Winston didn't do much better at mm. Chicago mm. Steamroll Tampa Bay, which mm. has some people on Twitter going right after you, Whitlock. Yes, they should. Oh, look at Winston that the helicopter. <laughs> Check he this hit. out. North Carolina. <laughs> he was hit. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> so the tweet was, wow, you nailed it on Winston. What a complete zero. Mm. Jameis has already been named for the starter as a starter for next week. We're like, you still sticking about James here? Hell yeah, and I was proven right. That's why they named him starter. You put him in down 35 to zero and that kind of pass rush against him. Yeah, he looked like trash, uh, but the whole Buccaneers are like trash. Jameis Winston should have started this week and he'll be starting from now on. Ryan Fitzpatrick, nice little story, yeah. but he's an Ivy League quarterback for a reason. <laughs> mm. I don't know if that's a shot or a compliment. I Just mean, a fact. You know, we're trying to win the game of life. We're trying to win the life. Football's a means to an end, damn it. He's trying to own a team one day, and he will. Um, Jameis looked horrible. Uh, I knew Fitzpatrick. Down 30. You ever came in a game down 35-0? Oh, you forgot I was a second string <laughs> player before. <laughs> yeah, I've been in many a games down 35-0, and it didn't mean nothing to me because I was trying to make my name. Um, Fitzpatrick looked horrible. That, two weeks in a row in the first half, we saw that. Uh, Jameis didn't look any better. And think about it, if you're Jameis Winston, I don't care what the circumstances are. You're a franchise quarterback. You're supposed to look a lot better than that. It's going to be interesting to see what he does from play one. Short week of prep, stood on the sidelines. It wasn't a short week for him. Cut. He got in there Wednesday like everybody else. <laughs> he just wasn't ready. Eric! I'm not ready. That's a, <laughs> a lot of Twitter off today. Moving on to some college yeah. football. All right. <laughs> Ohio State got a big win over Penn State after the Nittany Lions failed to convert this fourth and five. 
It left a lot of Penn State fans scratching their heads about why they took the game out on Trace McSorley's hands, mm. who was straight balling. This video went viral. James Franklin getting into it with the fan as he left the field. Franklin apologized for the exchange later, but do y'all still blame him for the loss? I, no, I blame him for the loss, and I blame him for this video. And I'm a huge James Franklin fan, a yeah. huge James Franklin fan. I hope David Bell, the best receiver in high school football, actually goes to Penn yes, State. Sir. Warren Central Plug. Hit him with the Dove C. Dove C. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hit him with the Dove C. But it, James Franklin looks ridiculous here. The fan actually just said, hey, bad call, coach. I love you, but that was a terrible call, and he went off like this. James Franklin owes Penn State fans an apology. This is a bad look. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, it was horrible to first call a timeout to stop the momentum. Okay, fine, you want to reassess the situation. Then you go out there and you take it out of your quarterback's hand who was basically dictating the game by going into obvious pass situations but taking off and running. It was just crazy. Like, at least give them that same option that was killing Ohio State. That said, uh, a joke is not funny when it's a bullseye. I remember hearing that from a comedian. And when someone says something to you and it hits you right where it's supposed to, it's not funny. And James Franklin reacted like that because the, the fan told the truth. That was a horrible call. You're supposed to be oblivious to that stuff, but the fan caught him right where Throw it Throw a rock into a pack of dogs, and the only one that yelps is the dog that got hit. Mm. And James Franklin got hit right between the eyes. Yep. All right, I think we got time for one more. We got some LeBron here. Yes. Actually. Moving on to LeBron's Laker debut, where he got nine points, a couple highlight plays, and a whole bunch of applause as the Lakers played their first preseason game in San Diego. But I want to talk about after the game. What? LeBron stole a package out of Kobe Bryant's playbook and took a helicopter home late last night. We all know the helicopter commute is Black Mamba's move. Y'all think LeBron is trying too hard to be like Kobe, a.k.a. the second greatest player in NBA history? <laughs> I'm going to be quick. He's an elite. This is an elite move. Y'all need to stop this. With LeBron's a special human being. He's not a commoner. Uh, and I don't think he speaks for common folks. He's taking helicopters home. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with it either. The five freeway, I don't give a damn if you knife man on the bench. You LeBron, if you got that dough, take it. It's not worth going on that five freeway. I'm with it. All right, today we're talking Big Ben, who came into the year with a lot of hype about being in the best shape of his life, but hasn't played like it. With another disappointing performance in yesterday's loss to the Ravens, I love Big Ben. He's my favorite player. But my rating for him is dropping. I have Big Ben at a total of 61. Whoa. Whoa. Job performance down 15 points to a 15. Mm. All-time greatness drops one. <clears throat> Character drops two to an 11. Authenticity stays the same at 50 at 15. Total of 61. Previously a 69. Role player. Wow, Jason, a lot of red on that paper there. Uh, <laughs> that's your favorite player in the NFL? You got a better role player? I like flawed. I like flawed people. Uh, I, I like Tiger Woods. I yeah. like Jim Brown. I'm flawed. I like flawed people. I, I get it. Um, that's taking it too far with this one. Um, it, it, the, the only thing about taking him down so much in job performance is he's missing what he needs, and that's Le'Veon Bell. And I know we've made arguments before when you don't have the proper resources around you. Uh, oh, so, so Marcel has just announced if I ever take a day off, his performance is going to plummet. <laughs> what do you mean we take a day off? What do you mean if I'm I on your schedule? Day, if you take a day off, trust me, I'm still going to be on point and on my job. But go ahead. I get it. Oh, I can't wait for that day then. I'm going to do a Wiley log. That Wiley log will going to be the whole A block. It's going to be 20 minutes. All right, let's give you my approval rating, and this is the better approval rating. Um, it's reflective of where he is. Uh, job performance, I do have him down three. Uh, despite, not as drastic as you, but despite no Le'Veon Bell, it's still not Big Ben of standard. Uh, All-time greatness down a couple, too, because I think this is starting to stain his resume. Hey, without Le'Veon, can you still be that franchise quarterback? At times, you have to say no. Characters, the same, 13. But here's the one that's interesting in authenticity. Nine. The same, because... That's low. Nine in authenticity. Why? People are not believing the message that is coming out of his mouth, uh, whether it's in that locker room and outside that locker room. This whole threaten to retire damaged some relationships in that locker room. But let's be real. This whole act, too, of Big Ben. And we know how Big Ben came into the league and his issues, but I always liked Big Ben. I knew him before he was even uh, in the NFL. Uh, a great guy. And then the act, too, is not as authentic to those around him as he's trying to sell it. So, you know, now Big Ben is funny. Watch him in any post-game interview. He's all happy. Hey, where should we go? Should I stand this way? That people sit there like, we remember 10 years of you doing interviews before this, and then it kind of trickles down to other levels of the game. So 
I think it, it affects him and it's just leadership. Almost out of time, only got like five, six seconds, but are you saying he doesn't sell as well in the locker room as he used to? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's coming across and it's materializing in the games that they play and in some of the leadership qualities.